So I've been making my own alcohol at home for the past decade or so, and I've tried a lot of different types of home brewing projects. And currently my favorite one is sake making due to what is a pretty simple process that yields outstanding results. Now I love making sake, but honestly, I had no idea what the general interest would be. So I just put out a short video a year ago on making it. And it turns out that a lot of you want more information. And that's what this video is about. So today I'm going to be giving you the full beginner's guide to brewing up this rice wine at home. Plus at the end of this video, I'm going to be putting up my sake in a little battle against three other store-bought sakes at different price points to see how it performs in a blind taste test. Now, thanks to this comment right here, I learned that sake in Japanese actually refers to a bunch of different alcoholic beverages. Nihonshu is the traditional Japanese term that refers specifically to rice wine. But over in the West, we said, no, actually sake is going to mean rice wine. And that just stuck around. So when I refer to sake in this video, I mean rice wine that specifically is made with these four ingredients, rice, koji, yeast, and water. Now, what I think is so unique about sake lies in the science of how it is brewed. Now, alcohol is produced when we take a sugary liquid and we add yeast and that yeast ferments those sugars into alcohol. So in the case of wine, we have all of these sugars readily available in the grape that gets fermented into alcohol. When it comes to beer, it's slightly different. We have these starchy grains that first have to be malted or basically germinated in order to access those sugars that can then be converted into alcohol. Now, when it comes to wine made out of rice, we have this grain that's made up of a bunch of complex starches, but how do we access the sugars within this grain? That's where koji comes into play. And if you've watched this channel, you know I love koji. I made an entire video dedicated to koji making. And basically koji is a rice that is inoculated with a mold that's then used to ferment a ton of different things like soy sauce and miso and of course sake. And what makes sake brewing so unique is that two different types of fermentation are happening at once, which is called parallel fermentation. Number one is the process called saccharification. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. This is the process of the koji converting those complex starches in the rice into simple fermentable sugars. And then when we have those simple sugars available, the second fermentation process, alcoholic fermentation can occur when we add that yeast and convert those sugars into alcohol. And what's great about sake making is you don't have to make your own koji. You do currently live in a world where you can buy koji online, or if you have a specialty Japanese market around you, they might just sell fresh koji. Now, of course, if you make it yourself, I think it's gonna lead to a better final sake process. And luckily for you, koji making is one of my favorite things to do at home. So I'm briefly going to go over how I made it for this sake. And there are a few things to keep in mind when you're making koji specifically for sake. Number one being the type of strain you use for your koji spores. Now koji spores can be bought on Amazon, but I like getting them from my friends over at Shared Cultures. They make all types of koji based products out of San Francisco, and they sell two specific strains of koji. The Aspergillus sojai is going to lean towards more of those umami notes. So great for soy sauce, great for miso making. You want to look for the Aspergillus orzai, which is going to give you some of those sweeter, more floral notes. And you can use both long or short grain rice for koji making. I actually found a really high quality medium grain rice. So I'm using something right in between. And I'm using four pounds of dried rice, which is going to give me five and a half pounds of my final koji product, which is exactly what one of these packets of spores is going to be able to make. I'll soak my koji overnight and for the the best koji product, you really want to steam your rice. That way you get these individual rice grains that the koji spores can totally surround and inoculate each grain versus a whole clump of rice sticking together where the spores can't get in. And I like using a cheesecloth to just keep everything contained. And I'll pop in a steamer basket in the bottom of a large pot so the bag doesn't actually boil in that water below. And it takes around 45 to 50 minutes total to steam the rice. And I do like giving it a flip around mid way so I get even rice cooking. And you can see after it comes out how that rice is perfectly cooked through, yet each grain is completely separated and not mashed together. And you want to wait for your rice to cool down to at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when I can sprinkle in my koji spores, making sure to mix them in evenly.
evenly throughout the rice. Now, koji is a tropical based mold, so it prefers a hot and humid environment to properly inoculate the rice. So to recreate that at home, the easiest way that I have found to do this is putting my rice into trays, placing a damp towel over the rice, then I'll wrap the trays in plastic wrap, making sure to poke a few holes in there just for some ventilation so that liquid can release, and then I'll pop it in the dehydrator at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. If you don't have a dehydrator, I've done this right on a heat mat in my kitchen, and that works as well to get that temperature up. And after 24 hours, this is what the rice looks like. You can see that white mold starting to spread through the rice grain, but not fully covering the grains, which is why this needs longer. So I'm gonna put the trays back in the dehydrator, and in total at this temperature, it generally takes around 40 to 50 hours to fully inoculate. All right, 40 hours later, we should have koji. It smells incredible. It's one of my favorite things about making koji is the perfume, the sweetness, the just completely unique aromas that come off of this stuff when you're making it. All right, ready? This is an exciting reveal. Oh, perfect matted koji. So there's some spores being created over here. That's the koji reproduction. But overall, we have a perfectly even mat. Check this out. Whoa, look at that. Like the whole thing just comes up like that. And if we break it in half, you can see the mold has spread completely through all of the rice. Just beautiful. Ooh, smells so good. You can eat this stuff. It's amazing already the sweetness that's produced on the rice from the mold. That's awesome. I'm gonna be using a good bit of this for the sake and I'll just save some in the fridge for another project. So when I went into making sake for the first time, to be honest, I was overwhelmed. There's not that much information out there. And some of the processes I did see were very complex with multiple additions at different times. And it wasn't until I found this video from Brew Show, which is fantastic. And most importantly, the process that he shows in the video is very simple. And I tried this out a few times and the product is fantastic. So before you comment in saying this isn't like a traditional way to make it, ultimately as a home brewer, I need to find something that's simple enough that I'm gonna repeat it over and over again and actually enjoy the process and not just quit. And that's what this version is. And speaking of something that's not traditional in the sake world, right off the bat, when we're talking about the type of rice used to make sake, they actually will polish off the outside of the rice kernel, which removes a lot of the proteins and fatty acids, just leaving that starchy inner core with the goal of giving you like the cleanest tasting sake. And they're doing this anywhere from 50 to 70%. And actually that percentage of polishing correlates to how high end the sake is, as you can see on this chart. But I'm pretty sure that the Japanese sake industry is actually the only industry that uses polished rice. So it's very unreasonable for anyone to get it at home. So I just use regular white rice and the sake comes out great, but of course we'll see how it compares in the blind taste test. And I'm using the same rice that I had from the Koji because it's high quality and I had a bunch of it. So in total, I'm using 10 pounds and I'll follow the exact same steps for the Koji, soaking the rice overnight, straining it off into a cheesecloth. I did give it a few washes to get off some of that excess starch and then I'll steam it. And this was actually the biggest batch of sake that I ever made. So the rice barely fit into the actual pot and I had to use some tin foil to keep in that steam. Now, while that's steaming, let's talk about another important ingredient, yeast, which is how we're gonna develop the alcohol. Now you can get specific sake yeast strains. This one I've used a few times, I've linked it below. It's a refrigerated yeast and it has to be activated for a few hours. But if you can't get this or find this, you can certainly make sake with just a simple dried wine yeast, which is very easy to find on Amazon. Now, after 50 minutes, the rice was steamed, so I took that out and I don't have to let it cool this time because I can just add it right to a clean fermenting vessel because I'm adding cold water on top, which will cool things down. And if you don't have a vessel like this, it's totally fine. You can use a five gallon bucket like this to ferment your sake. And one thing to keep in mind is you do want to find a container that matches the size of sake that you are brewing. You don't want to be brewing a little bit of sake in a huge container where there's so much room for oxygen to build up in that container. And I would say one of the trickiest parts about sake 
sake making is getting the right ratios of ingredients. This is something I'm still learning as I brew batch after batch because there's really not that much information on the internet about home brewing. So if you're making a small batch, I have found that you can find some great recipes online and you can follow those. Boom, you're good to go. But for big batches like this, I've had to sort of experiment a little. The best thing I found so far was a blog that had this ratio right here, which I'm gonna be following for this batch. I'll put all the specifics down in the description plus any other information I have to help you out on this process. So I added in all my filtered water, I added in my koji, I added in my yeast, and there's one more ingredient that I didn't mention that's just added to prevent bacteria spoilage. And a lot of recipes will use citric acid, but Bruchot in his video, he used a little bit of hops, which will actually do the same thing. And I did have some hops left over from a recent beer making project. So I soaked some of those and poured those in. Then I'll just pop on the top. And what that's gonna do is create a nice seal where the CO2 built up from the fermentation is gonna push out that oxygen, creating the perfect environment for proper alcohol fermentation. And in total, it's gonna take around three weeks for the sake to ferment. I started mine off at room temperature right here in this room so I could easily monitor it. And just after the first day, it was super active and bubbly. And then after one week, I transferred my sake down to my fermenting room where the temperatures were a little lower, around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, where it sat there and finished for the next two weeks. And I like this little spout so I can taste it along the way and really see how it's fermented. So after three weeks, the sake was tasting nice. So I sent it through a cheesecloth to remove all of the solids, all of that rice and that koji. So I just had the alcohol left over. That smells so good. Overall, it just has a very beautiful floral sake smell, but you really, you can pick up on the floralness of the koji, and then you get hit with the alcohol built in fermentation. Wow, amazing. Take this. By the way, it's easier to make a smaller batch than what I did. And sake can be served in this state right here. I actually like a sake that's milky like this, but the next process is gonna give us a clear sake, which I'm gonna go over now. Oh, that was terrible. So I'm just straining out the final bits of rice particles, but you can really see that half of the original sake was like up to here, it was just rice. This is the final strained alcohol contents. Now, I actually prefer my sake cloudy. I like the taste and the, the slight difference in texture, but I can't do this for the taste test because it would be too obvious since I didn't buy any other cloudy sake. So what I'm gonna do to combat this is put my sake in the refrigerator overnight. And what that's gonna do is separate the clear stuff from the cloudy at the bottom. And then I use this clear tube to funnel the sake right into my bottles. And then once I filled up a bunch of bottles, then I'll mix up the sake to get some cloudy sake, which which I'll funnel into the pop top bottles. And then I get to do one of my favorite things, which is corking these bottles, labeling them, and then getting them off into the cellar to age, which is a very important element of sake making. Just like wine, sake will taste better as it ages. It starts to smooth out. That bite of the alcohol starts to mellow out a bit. Unfortunately, I didn't have much time for this blind taste test, so these bottles just got to age for two weeks. Blind taste test for sakes, completely different price ranges. All of this is chilled because, actually one is not a good sake, but I had to chill them all. Hot sake is generally for shittier sake. Yeah. At least in this country, that's how sake is consumed. No one knows anything except myself. We're gonna start here and we're gonna try them one by one with water in between. I wanna hear like honest reviews for each sake gotcha. in the moment. There's no way to do this without getting a little bit tipsy. Yeah, basically. Yeah, four shots yeah. of sake. <laughs> so everyone, Start here at one. All right. Go a little Cheers. bit. Cheers. Salud. Cheers. Super sweet. Very light. Knowing what koji smells like yeah. has completely changed my reference of like Dang. what this flavor is. Totally. Because it tastes like tropical fruit, but it's koji. It does have a fruity quality to it. Yeah, it's really, it's sweet, but it's light. It's not like nauseating. Yeah. And it's kind of like, has like more of a viscous. Cooper, and what you know, do you think? I think I'm realizing I've had really <laughs> shitty stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is a first this, meal. This tastes good. This one smells very different. Much like greener, cleaner than fruity. 
Oh yeah. Like this one's drier. Boozier. Yeah. There's more of a bitterness to it. The yeah. Other. The other one was much smoother, like lighter. It tastes like a higher alcohol content mm. than the last one. Mm, I like this one a lot. Moving on, number, is this three? Yeah. Number three. This one like doesn't have much of a smell at all. Oh, that one's really interesting. This is the driest one and the lightest one. Like it's not viscousy. Like it has much more of like a drier mouth feel. I'm getting like a, a tartness to this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like green apple kind of. Yeah. Smells a lot more like the first yeah. one. Like I think it's gonna be sweet. This one's really good. Number four. It's probably this one's gonna probably be the cheapest one, but like oh, interesting. yeah, that is really good. Like less dry than the last one, but still like not viscous like the first one. It's definitely more drinkable than two. One was much smoother, but this is more in that camp than it is the other with the like more acidic or bitter sakes. This one is a lot smoother. Mm. Oh my god, I'm so nervous. <laughs> so this is Shane. This is Cooper. It's very different. So, so different. All right. All right. And I'm gonna do the reveal. So number one is Brooklyn Cora. Ah. And that's the most expensive one, right? No. Oh. Second most expensive. This was the it's sweet. My favorite this one. Is. Yeah. This was number two for me. It's the most drinkable, light, refreshing. It's undeniably a delicious. Okay. okay. A little denied. <laughs> yeah. I gave it third place. <laughs> number two. Carly. Do I love cheap sake? Carly. <laughs> what did I say? You're, you're out, Carly. We don't <laughs> trust your abilities. Unsurprising that I love cheap sake. By okay. far. <laughs> when I tasted this, I thought it tasted like rubbing up my uh, person. Wow. I get a lot of taste yeah. Shane is number oh, three. Oh, it's so Third good. Place. Cooper, number three. Yeah. Number three, I am a little bit sad about this, is my sake. Uh, Cooper, uh, yeah, baby. Number one. Carly, you switched it last second. Well, I switched it because I realized that. That hurt my feelings. Sorry. And then that leaves the most expensive one, which is funny. Shane had the most expensive one. Second. All right, Second. I'd say that balances Cooper me out. Cooper had it last. Oh, oh well, and cheapest was my favorite. The most second. expensive was my second. All favorite. over the place. Really crazy. Yeah. I'll take Cooper coming in at number one. At um, least you know that we were honest. Though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's very interesting. The fact that Carly Carly picked, like that to me tasted so bad and you have a number one, which I think is fascinating. It shows you yeah. how the variety of also, taste and, buds. Yeah and, yeah, and preference. Yeah. yeah. Total preference. So good. I don't know how they put this at the bottom of the list. For what it's worth, I did my own blind taste test where I just closed my eyes, mixed up the cups, and my sake for me, I had tasted it before, of course, not the final product. It won by a mile. Then went these two, which I thought were very similar, and by far the last was the cheaper bottle, which tasted like rubbing alcohol to me. So I would say my sake is a bit polarizing. It's either your favorite or your least favorite. <laughs> two things that I think would improve the sake. One is less hops, I think maybe that was adding to some of the bitterness that Shane and Carly didn't love. And then two is just aging it longer. I think that would have taken off some of the bite that I think they were talking about. When I taste it, I just think it has the most unique flavor. Like it tastes like green apples and bubble gum. It's so yummy. But I do get what they're talking about with that bite. And I think with just aging, a lot of that will go away. So I'll report back. Maybe I'll do like a short video on how it ages over time. But this is all experimentation. That's what fermentation is. You gotta get in there. You gotta be a little scientist and experiment and improve every time and have some fun. That's all I gotta say.